Um, I might have to sit here actually, if I can't quite get you all in. Maybe a bit I can. A bit uncomfortable, but never mind. All right. Okay, don't know what happened there. Phone just turned off. Dead. Oh, okay. Is it, is it? Oh, is this on? That is not even plugged in. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, can you just push that up on that one there? Oh. So there's no battery on that, so I have to use my phone. We saw Billy leaving and we were so sad. Billy! I know, we wanted to give Billy a hug He was today. so just couldn't wait to get out of here, could he? He's like, okay, Mama, see you in another time. And I said, no talking. Oh, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> My Billy, I'll miss you. See you in November. <laughs> What's your last name? The Bollies. Spell it for me. B-A-L-I. B-A-L-I. Like the island. Bally. And the extinct tiger. And the extinct tiger. That's <laughs> Right, let's try again. Just wait a second. You're not plugged in Which now. Camera do we no, but my phone's got battery. I'm oh, sorry, everybody. Uh, my other phone died. Um, we are here with a wonderful family, and um, Vax team last night had the real honor of being in your house and eating your amazing food. Literally the best meal we've had on tour. All wonderful food, homemade. It's just a new. I cannot stop talking about it. Um, <laughs> Josh missed it, so I bet you were sad about that. <laughs> and then we missed it. Josh. You did, you missed it. Del stole me, sorry. Um, so what you also missed, Josh, was the story, and it's, a, it's an important story, this, because as you will hear in a minute, it's a tragic story, mm -hmm. um, but it's another side that we hear about, not as often as the just plain vaccine injury, but this is another side that we hear of the consequences of vaccine in a, in a different way to the, than we are experiencing, but more and more we're hearing your story, so you're not alone with your story. Um, these two are just adorable. This one washed the dishes. Was, how old are you? You're eight years old and you washed the dishes. Bella and Toby, listen up. <laughs> eight years old. And you were just charming and polite and chatting away. We just, we just enjoyed your company so much, so thank you very much. All right, let's get on with the story. Um, it's painful for you all to talk about it again, I know, but um, we do so appreciate it. Um, so in, I'm, I always suck at this story. <laughs> you don't suck, you did it last night, that was amazing. Okay, so. Yeah. So in uh, 2007, we also had a third child. So Gavi is the firstborn. And then 13 months later, we had Minakshi. And so I was overwhelmed, to say the least, they were like twins. <laughs> and um, in 2007, uh, Meenakshi was two. And, and she was fully vaccinated, wasn't she? The kids were fully vaccinated. You know what, I, when I was just watching the film just now, um, I want, it made me remember that we were researching vaccines. I was questioning vaccines um, not because we didn't want to be, like you say in the film, like we wanted to be the perfect parents, we wanted to do everything, you know, perfectly. I mean, what mom and dad isn't, we were reading all the books, we were doing everything to be like the perfect parents. And we made the decision that I was gonna stay home and, you know, stay with the kids, and that was gonna be the best thing for us. And so Cubby was fully uh, vaccinated, but before the kids were born, we were interviewing pediatricians, and I was asking them about the vaccines, and I was, you know, confused because I've only been, I've only had two vaccines my whole life, and then I, I thought I was the one with the extra vaccine because they were giving us um, the tetanus shot for, because we were traveling to India, so because we were traveling internationally, we had one extra shot, but I was confused when they were saying that they were going to vaccine in the hospital the day the baby was born um i just couldn't wrap my mind around giving a shot to a small baby like did, that now did he have the vaccine on day one or was it introduced just a bit your so medical? when i was asking them the questions then i was never really getting a good answer um but the day but day one they said would be vitamin k and I was asking if there was some other way to do the vitamin K. Why did we need the vitamin K? I didn't get a vitamin K. You know, what were they doing on Little House on the Prairie at the beginning? Like, I was very confused. So, 
they um, told me they could give an oral vitamin K. And then I was, so I, so I let them do that. Then with every other vaccine, I asked them, is there an oral version of medication instead of actually uh, violating the, the bloodstream? And, um, and they said, well, no, but then at his time, there were fewer vaccines than Mina's time. And there's 13 months between them. Yes, I mean, it was all, I mean, there were many more vaccinations between him and her. And So Mina was a beautiful, healthy baby girl. She was a beautiful, healthy baby girl. She was advanced, she was articulate, she was speaking like, I mean, if you ever met her and you had listened to her talk, you wouldn't believe she was two when she was speaking so articulately. But uh, before, I mean, both of the kids were, were brilliant. I guess I'm a little partial with that, but <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't, I mean, I was looking into this and while I was looking into it, when you watch the film, then they're having the debate, they're having the argument and all of that part is happening, what, 2002, between 2002 and 2004 and you know they actually start talking about it 2010 so when I'm watching the film I'm just getting so mad because I'm looking for information I can't find any of it so because I'm wondering about it but I don't have any definitive answers I feel too afraid not to vaccinate them so I did but I was trying to delay them a little bit and they allowed me to do that and like I said with Covey's time there weren't as many vaccinations and so it was, I mean, he didn't get as many shots probably as, as other children just because they allowed us to push some of those back. And any time that I was able to do something orally instead, we did that. And my um, pediatricians were, I think, really good about that. As far as flu and everything else goes, we never did that because I knew, like one of my good friends got the flu shot, he was paralyzed. And so we, I would never participate in that. And so, uh, and they also let me, uh, interestingly, like my pediatricians would let me skip anything that was like Hep B. I was like, isn't that a sexually transmitted disease? Like, why do we need to do that shot? So she didn't have the Hep B. Um, they did end up getting it later because I don't even remember honestly. Like, they gave me some reasoning that made me believe, okay, maybe they should have it. But then we never did it again. But that one time, I don't know. You know, like I was telling you last night, like I felt foolish. You know, how many times are we going to be fooled? Um, you know, and, and later when I think back on it, I'm like, God, I was such an idiot. Like, I can't believe that I knew this, this, and this, but I missed that or, or what have you, because maybe I wouldn't have given them the vaccination. I don't, I'm not sure, but, but that aside, they were vaccinated and developed fine, didn't they? I mean, these guys were developing beautifully, so I don't know. I mean, I didn't realize that there, I don't know, the kids all both had um, eczema and Maybe that should have been a sign. I'm not sure, but in, in Mina's case, we when we when she got her MMR vaccination, then she developed full-on thrush. And what the heck is thrush? Like I didn't know what that was. My mother didn't know what that was. My mother-in-law didn't know what that was. We were very concerned about that. And I was telling you guys yesterday that you know our daughter didn't have autism. She had cancer. In 2007, she was diagnosed with esthesio neuroblastoma. It was Labor Day weekend. Um, on Friday, I had found out I was pregnant with this one. And on Monday, we found out that Meenakshi had a head full of tumor. Um, you know, we ended up doing emergency room to emergency room transfer from WakeMed to Duke. Um, they, they don't give you time to even absorb this and and in her case she was being suffocated with a head full of tumor from inside out she presented as if it was a sinus infection and so we were thinking that you know maybe um, her head is swelling a little bit because of the antibiotic because we had never given our kids antibiotics before uh, I come from a family of you know holistic physicians and both uh, allopathic and holistic physicians and so we grew up with homeopathy and um, I didn't feel the need to try to do anything allopathic uh, until we couldn't get her to breathe so then we thought okay we maybe we'll give her an antibiotic so we give her the antibiotic her head starts swelling maybe she's having an allergic reaction to penicillin maybe it's something else we're not sure we go to the hospital they send us for a CT scan we didn't know that a two-year-old is not supposed to get a CT scan we didn't know that 
this is very aggressive. So we go there, they do the CT scan, boom, we find out she has a head full of tumor. We get to Duke, they tell us they can't operate. It's uh, threatening all her vital structures. And the only thing that we can do, they say, is emergency chemo. I mean, it's a lot to wrap your head around, right? So, so we're sitting there, we're trying to process this. Um, our parents come in, we're contacting family around the world, you know, who are physicians, who we're asking them, you know, like, what do you think about this? What do you think we should do? Everybody's screaming at us, like, don't start chemo. Once you start chemo, then, you know, it's kind of over. Anyway, the long and the short of it is that she endured five rounds of chemo. It did nothing but grow her tumor. Um, and we were at our wit's end. I was about to deliver this one. And we may, we finally spoke to someone at Harvard who, who said, you know, because my husband at the same time had been looking into alternative therapies, like anybody would. We have a gun to our head. We're like trying to figure out all the ways that we can try to help save her. And um, we find out that maybe there's a proton beam therapy that we can look into. So we speak to Harvard and they're like, if, if you do this, your child will never be whole again. And the first time that a physician is saying, no, we don't want to do this, but they're not saying we're not going to do this. They're saying, if we do this, then this is what will happen. And for the first time, my husband is now agreeing with me a little bit that maybe we need to just stop. You know, maybe we need to do something else or stop this and just, so we have a, a conversation with our family and we say, okay, we're going to go holistic with this. And, um, my mother-in-law is like, what does that mean? Like, you're not going to treat her now. You know, there's no medicine. You don't like, what are we going to do? And I said, I don't know. So we stop and, and I'm very pregnant <laughs> and I'm cleaning things up and I don't know what comes over me. You know, like I just decide I'm going to, you know, something in this house is killing her. It's the food. It's the environment. And, and Duke is saying, no, this has nothing to do with food and environment. And I can't even believe that. I mean, it goes against everything that I've ever known because, you know, our family has always said, you know, homeopathy or whatever is all based on, you know, using food as medicine. And I don't, something led me right back to that. I cannot tell you why. Um, so now I, my husband comes home from work and I have cleaned out everything. I've taken everything out of my refrigerator, everything out of the freezer, everything out of every cabinet under the kitchen sink. If it was a cleaner or whatever it was, I collected it in, and you've seen the kitchen and the family room. Like it was the span of all of that. And, and I'm just crying. My husband comes home and he's like, what's wrong? And I said, you see all this crap? Like we're gonna throw this away and I never want you ever to buy it and bring it back in this house again. And he's just not arguing with me because I'm very pregnant. And, and I said, this is like causing cancer. I don't, I don't know what's happening. We have to throw it away. So then he's just, he's so nice. He's just like, so what are we going to eat? And I said, I have no idea. But the next day I started, you know, we were already going to local farmer's markets for vegetables, but it never occurred to me that I should look for meat there or, or something because you don't normally see that. You go to a, a farmer's market and you see produce everywhere, but you don't see any meat or anything. And so I started looking for that and I started asking um, the farmers, you know, where can I get meat? What can we do for meat? Because I don't know. You know, I don't want to buy anything now unless I know who's raising it and where it's coming from. And so they started connecting me. And then I started going out to visit the different farms. Then I started learning that there's almost nobody growing real food anymore because um, it's they've industrialized all the food. Now we have all these CAFOs. So it's the confined animal feeding operations like Smithfield. And in North Carolina, we have the largest CAFOs in the world. And, and I'm floored. And I can't even believe this. And I can't wait to tell everybody that I know that they can't eat that stuff in the grocery store because what's happening with it? And so I start finding local farms. I find out that they want to grow the food better, but they don't have a market for it. And they said, you know, like, we can't just grow this for you. And I said, okay, well, I don't know. I mean, clearly I need to start 
a market, create a market for these people. And I mean, it's a perfect time, right? Because I have a child with cancer. I'm pregnant with this one. Uh, yeah, this is what I need to do now. I need to now start a market. So I, I don't know. We, I, I told him, I said, well, I'll do the best that I can. And we start eating the food. We start giving it to Mina. And guess what? Four months. We've been on the food for four months. This one's born. Mina's still alive. She seems to be doing fine, but we can't guess. We have to test, right? So we go in for our MRI, and um, I get a call from Duke. They say, we need to talk to you. We've never seen this before. So, you know, by the way, Duke is building a case against us for being irresponsible parents because we refuse treatment. Um, they've locked... Seriously? Anyway, let's get to the end of the story so yeah, people yeah, yeah. understand that. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're building a case against us because they're saying that we're being irresponsible. They, um... Go, um carry on with the story. Go back yeah, to... Yeah, yeah. So you went back with Mina, and you go in there, and you've got your mother-in-law with you. Mm -hmm. And tell that bit. You're my like, mom. So my mom, mom is a firecracker. My mother-in-law is very emotional. I don't know if she could have even handled it. My mom comes with me. And so we're sitting there, and the... Um, attending is going over the report from the MRI and she's saying so it appears that the tumor has become necrotic and whatever some medical jargon blah 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 something something and you know I'm just kind of stuck on the one word that got my attention you know and she says all this stuff and my mom is like diligently making all of her notes and everything and I said okay so necrotic that means dead right like you're saying something's dead it's dead the cancer's dead and and they said yeah the the tumor has is dead and I said okay so does that mean that the ca cancer is anywhere else it's metastasized somewhere else or it's gone it's all gone what are we saying it's nowhere she has no more cancer four months four months of me doing that and before that it kept growing while she's under treatment and what did your mother say and so my mom, my mother is hilarious, right? She's, she's like, okay, so my English is not very good. Uh, I just want to make sure that I understand what you're saying because now she's pissed because she knows they're building this case against us. So she says, well, let me just get this straight. So are you saying that what you were doing was not working and what my daughter is doing is working? And the cancer is dead. Is that what you're saying? Thank you. Like, you know, and the doctor's not acknowledging her. And she's saying, well, and she says, well, isn't that what has happened? Like, every time we have the MRI in the past, the cancer is growing, the tumor is growing. And now it's dead. Is that correct? So then I'm excited to share what we're doing because I feel, you know, I've, I have a lot of friends in there in the hospital now because we've or all these mothers we're all sitting around and we're you know comforting each other and I mean there's over 40 rooms on the fifth floor with Hemonk and I want them to use this information and help everybody else I said do you want me to tell you what we've been doing because like you know this could really help because they've they just told me they've never seen this before and she's like sure let me go get a notepad and a pen and never comes back now family services walks in and they're like so she goes out so she's gonna get a notebook never comes back but sends in family services like that like that i mean i later found out they're all gag ordered to, they aren't able, they're not supposed to discuss nutrition they will not discuss nutrition as a solution to cure cancer and they wouldn't let me share it i mean they had to have known it I, you know the more i think about it now it makes me so angry that you know i'm just a mom i'm nobody and i can figure this out truly like i'm sure hematology oncology has seen this before it can't just be that i'm the only one i mean i know i'm not the only one someone else has had to have done this and now it's being revealed in the truth about cancer and all of these other things that are being documented but you know what so since then so now i'm working with mina by the way we oh four months later we do a second scan now the tumor has become a cyst. Now it's scary because it's just full of fluid and we don't know what might happen with her, but it's just 
going away the tumor. And, you know, we're talking about esthesia neuroblastoma. When you're given this diagnosis, you have literally normally 24 hours before you're dead. Every other child that was ever, you know, presented with this particular case, they were dead within 24 hours. By the way, they want to know what happened to social services when they came in. We got into kind of a fight because I was very um, offended. I was offended. And, uh, they left you alone? Um, now, interestingly, I'm getting, I was getting calls from Duke. Now we're invited to come meet Coach K. Now they want pictures with Mina and Coach K and the basketball team. And now they're sending us on beach trips and, you know, you know, they, they definitely stopped looking for us after that, I guess, but. All right, so back, so back to Mina. So how, how, so she has a cyst. You carry on feeding her really good food, and then what happened? So we extended her life for two years. I mean, and you know that's equivalent to 20 adult years. And uh, interestingly, you know, when a when a child is diagnosed with cancer, they're always inpatient. They're never outpatient. And why? Because you know her metabolism is so great. Uh, at that age of two, you know, it's it, one year is equivalent to 10 years in an adult. So uh, they also get 10 years worth of research out of children. And what was happening in her case is, is, is what you see, you know, most adults who go into remission are in remission for 10 to 20 years and then they generally relapse. And in her case, it was the same thing. All of a sudden in August, um, of 2009, she lost her vision in her right eye all of a sudden. She, she was taking naps and, you know, and I was like, oh no. So we took her in to get an MRI and um, we found out secondary cancers have appeared, you know, as a result of chemo. I mean, it is one of the side effects of chemotherapy. And also, I have to say, I did not know as much as I do now about the food. We didn't know how, how much poison uh, sugar and grain is. Otherwise, we would never would have given that to her. But, you know, I want to make one thing very clear about her is that in Mina's case, her entire sphenoid bone had already been eaten up. I mean, she, let's just be clear. She was already shattered by the cancer. The cancer had damaged her body. So, you know, we knew it was palliative. We knew that we weren't going to be able to keep her alive forever because she was missing pieces in her head that she would have needed to develop. But, um... She gave us a mission. She gave us medical proof, you know, that food is medicine. She, um, I have MRIs to prove it for anybody who wants to see. How long did she live for? for she was diagnosed at two. She lived till she was four. And when it was like every other child, I mean, every single kid in, you know, on that Hemont floor with us at that time, they would either go home in remission, they'd be back within weeks, be dead within days where they never left the hospital. But every single one of them died. And what, you know what, what's interesting though, Polly, is that if someone went home in remission, they counted it as a win in the statistics for chemotherapy. And then when they come back, it's a new, new count. But they never um, count like that. I mean, they never make note that they're all literally losses. And then, you know, as I go on to learn more about this food thing and I, I start this whole food movement or whatever, you know, I started this meat riot basically is what I call it. And it was a meat riot because you can find clean produce pretty easily. You can even grow sprouts yourself in a jar, but you can't find meat and you need meat. You need fat. Like, you know, even Dr. Brennan was just saying, like, you know, on a cellular level, level for you to remediate, you have to have clean fat. And so you have to have animals. And so we were always adamant about making sure that we, we didn't, we weren't like a lot of people who would decide to just go vegan, um, which is not a normal human diet. It's a political movement, which is fine. But I wanted a different political movement. I wanted the meat riot because I wanted for us to be able to have clean animals. And I knew from having created these relationships with the farms that you can have that, but you just, there's no market for it right now because people have no idea because like myself they thought you know you know you go to the grocery store and you see all natural chicken and it's really cool packaging and everything and it's 
you know, a little bit more expensive than the other. I was thinking, you know, that's marketing 101. State the obvious. It's all natural chicken. But I mean, I had no idea that these animals don't have the five essentials for life. They can't, you know, unhealthy animals cannot nourish you. You have to have animals that are healthier than you are to be able to nourish you. And because post-World War II, America decided to feed the world and they went and, you know, started using all of our war chemicals to create herbicides and pesticides and these petrochemical fertilizers, they've adulterated all of our food and now all these animals are diseased and you know you can't feed diseased animals to people and profit off of that and expect there to be no repercussion and now they're killing children and us and people you know are saying oh you know she's an extreme radical crazy cancer mom really I don't understand. Now now everybody's saying, well, you know, we try to eat healthy. You don't need to eat healthy. Just eat real food. How about know the difference between imitation food and real food? Or be aware of, you know, industrialized, diseased animals, which I call poison. Isn't it poison? What is it? What is it called when you walk into the woods to go hunting and a deer is leaning up against a tree? What do you call that? Convenient? Is that convenience food? I, I'm, I'm not sure like I'm confused why 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 do people not understand what I'm saying if I'm saying that these animals are diseased you know people are up in arms that they see you know chickens in cages okay why aren't you disturbed that they're in houses also why aren't you disturbed that they never see sunlight or have sunshine the five essentials for life are sunshine and clean air and you know clean water and uh, clean soil and correct feed if those animals aren't being fed correctly like you know herbivores should never eat grain why are you eating grain fed beef it makes no sense those animals are in kidney and renal failure and they fed that to us they fed it to our children and for the longest time I thought that was why she had cancer and then I, I think it is some of that you know because I believe that for that reason you know my immunity may not have been as strong as it should have been so then that way my children wouldn't have had as strong of immunity right and then we immunize them because we think that's what we're supposed to be doing and I told you that Mina had thrush well did you know that you know when you have uh, that much um, yeast like a a flooding of your body of yeast like that that's the first sign of cancer coming on so that was just days after her shot and now you have dr. Humphreys I mean if you listen and, and pay attention to what she's talking about um, you know what is it called now that she's talking about the um, I'm sorry I'm like become emotional I can't about lots of things. yeah 